Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday afternoon and welcome to the final edition of the Wednesday afternoon webinar that Barometer has been hosting since this pandemic started uh, through till the next year. 2021. We really appreciate everyone tuning in every Wednesday, so thank you for joining us. Today we will, as always, provide you with a brief market overview, and of course at the end of this call we will be happy to take your questions. I've had a few already roll in this afternoon, so looking forward to addressing those. With my co-host and Commander-in-Chief David Burroughs, President and Chief Investment Strategist here at Barometer Capital. David, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pam. I can't believe we've done uh, almost a year of these things. And, uh, and my guess is they're probably here to stay. Uh, yeah, I but so. uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and thanks, uh, Pam, for, for kicking us off today. Uh, yeah. This probably is the last call for the year. Uh, until the beginning of January. So there's a lot to talk about today. Wow. I mean, what a, what a year it has been. Um, and, uh, and certainly it's not going out quietly. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, about markets. Just uh, as a reminder, from, from our standpoint, really our job is to surveying the landscape, use the tools that we have to try and identify productive spots to, to deploy capital. Uh, we don't need to be everywhere. We have to find sort of the key leadership themes, the things that are being revalued in the market where we have a tailwind uh, and focus our attention there. The best kind of markets for us are markets where there is relatively low correlations between individual stocks and certainly in between asset classes. Uh, and we certainly are in, in that category as it sits right now. So our job is to try and find those leadership themes and focus in those areas. Uh, watch very closely for signs of, of change uh, major rotation so that we can keep the portfolios relevant uh, in the current climate. This is a, 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 an active strategy. And of course, there are those periods of time where we have to play some defense. And so using stop losses on all of our positions, uh, using our breadth-based models to pull us out of groups where the tide is going out uh, is very, very important. So we are taking quite a tactical approach to this. As most of you know, we believe we entered a secular bull market in 2013 in U.S. stocks. Uh, after a long dry spell between 2000 and 2013, tends to be when you come out of those secular bear markets like the one between 1966 and, and 82, uh, the asset class is generally underloved. Uh, it's generally, uh, there are lots of reasons why you wouldn't wanna be there. Uh, uh, and generally these rallies go on a lot longer than you think, of course, with interruptions along the way. But I think the most important thing is to have the big broad theme understood so you can be focused in assets where you, you have a tailwind. Um, uh, S&P has been working its way higher since 2013, interruptions in 15, 16, and interruptions in 2018, and of course in, in 2020. Uh, but we continue in this broad channel. We're about uh, seven years into what likely will be, you know, 12, 15, 18 years uh, with some cyclical bear markets along the way, like the one we had uh, early this year, uh, but uh, it is a market where it is three steps forward, one step back. Uh, when we look at the um, uh, NASDAQ, NASDAQ similarly uh, came out of a big base, but it didn't do it until 2016 uh, when we kicked off a new bull market, taking out the highs from 2000. Uh, and again, uh, I know it's been good and I know that there will be pullbacks but certainly the structural bull market is, is a wind at our back. When we look at other asset classes, I think that uh, for those of, uh, of, of you that know us well, we believe we've been going through a, a generational low in interest rates uh, and that we're in the process of reversing that. And, and I always like to point out that what worked in the structural bull market in rates uh, is very different than works in, in a structural uh, period of falling rates. Uh, and so it's really important to get that right uh, and to be watching for signs that there is a regime change taking place. Commodities also go in very, very long cycles. This is an incredibly long chart, <clears throat> uh, uh, which I which I stole from a from a from a uh, from a business partner, um, but ultimately showing very long cycles up and down of relative performance versus stocks and compound annual returns and. We are at really at a very low ebb 
uh, and in our view, likely going through a structural shift, just like we are in interest rates. So if you look at it on a shorter term basis, and when I say shorter term since 1970, several uh, uh, big structural bull markets and structural bear markets of which when we have been in one since uh, 2008. So let's talk in the short run uh, stocks, uh, S&P 500 after uh, coming off the lows in March, consolidated a little bit in June, we rallied through into the end of August where as usual, we went into a sort of a, a consolidation period in the fall period of bumpiness. Frankly, the bumpiness was not as significant as one might have expected with an election coming and a second wave of a pandemic. But ultimately we broke out of that range and here we are really, uh, I think closing today at new highs. You can see though, lots of consolidation volume took place uh, in the period between August and November when we finally broke out. Uh, and of course, once we got above all of that trading, uh, um, a little bit more free and clear to move. NASDAQ, a similar picture, uh, underperformed for a period of time when the cyclical stocks started to rally in November, the financials and the industrials. We talked about this around the time of the election that while they were underperforming for a period of a couple of weeks, it was likely that both could rally, both the cyclicals and the secular growth stocks uh, as we went through the remainder of the year, uh, as you sort of ground through some of that repositioning that was taking place. And that's because it's not just money that is hostage to the market that is moving around. There is new money being brought to work in equities. We've seen good inflows through the month of November and early December. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, money coming from other asset classes, not just from within the equity asset class. So uh, we also know we had a little bit of weakness about, uh, about 10 days ago in some of the biggest NASDAQ stocks, arguably index investors have been pulling money from companies like Amazon and Apple and Google and Netflix to make room for the very large weighting in Tesla coming into the index on the on the 18th and the 21st. And that should be close to done. Interesting, we've started to see those move a little higher, but you can see lots and lots of volume traded in this range. So now I think you know that we come at this not so much focused on what the indices look like at the surface because they are dominated by the biggest companies. We like to assess health of an asset class or a sector or a theme based on whether breadth is improving, the number of stocks doing well is expanding or whether it's contracting. And we know that when a rally begins, often in a very difficult period, the strongest stocks turn up first. And then as a little bit more money is brought to bear within uh, whatever area we're looking at, a few more stocks start to participate and the buying spreads. And in a healthy market, as you go through a cycle, breadth consistently expands until you get to a point where almost everything is working. Now, the problem is two things. When everything's working, the risks start to get higher because good stocks are going up and not so good. But also it is the most productive period of time because almost everything participates. We also know though, that there's almost no bear market in history that ever took place while breadth was expanding and secondarily, that there was no bear market or major correction ever took place before days or weeks of deterioration in breadth. So in other words, the leaders carrying on while the weaklings start to sell off. So at Barometer, our process is all about understanding whether breadth is contracting or expanding. We do it across all major asset classes. We do it within asset classes for geographic regions. We do it for industry groups. We do it for market caps. We do it for themes. We do it for styles. And our job is to identify areas of expanding breadth, focus on the leading securities within those groups to exploit that theme and stay there as long as it works until we start to see deterioration in breadth, which often gives us a message before the leading securities start to get hurt to start reducing our positions, to tighten up our stop losses. And once breadth starts to deteriorate, no new money goes into that theme. So of course we've been watching very closely because there's been clear leadership through the course of this year. The market has continued to broaden. 
And we watch for any sign of contraction in breath because frankly, sentiment is very strong, right? Flows into equities have been very strong. Lots of people get concerned when markets start to make new highs. You know, are we hitting a market high? But I can tell you, so long as breadth is expanding, it's a healthy market. So what, what do we know? We know our long-term indicators for Canada, for the US, and for global equities are all showing expanding breadth. So if you gave every stock in the US a single vote and quantified whether it is in higher highs and higher lows and uptrend, the percent of stocks and uptrends has been expanding. Same for global stocks, same for Canadian stocks. Now, though, that's looking at long-term trends. When we break it into shorter-term measures, for instance, the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average in Canada, in the US, and globally, that is expanding. Now, we break it out by each individual market, and virtually every market in the world is seeing expansion of breadth. So it started in the US, and breadth has expanded through the rest of the global markets. So the equity asset class appears to be very healthy. Recently, we had a little bit of a reduction in the upward trajectory of some stocks. That's momentum. But the percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows has ex continued to expand. Percent of stocks trading above their 150-day and 200-day moving averages continue to expand. This is a healthy market. Now, when breadth is expanding, it can handle a lot. And we know there's a lot of negative news in the world, a lot of negative news around COVID. There's a lot of concern around the transition of power in the US. We talked in November about the fact that we were likely at a point of maximum uncertainty and slowly things might start to unveil themselves over the next number of weeks. And I think that that's the case. I think it's pretty with confidence we can say that there will be a, a peaceful transition of power in the US. Uh, certainly the vaccines are helping. It looks as though there may be additional stimulus. But when you look at the balance between good and bad, there are more things good than bad bringing money and flows into the equity asset class. Other things that we watch, volatility. Volatility spiked early in the year. It has been coming down. Frankly, still well above the average of volatility through 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So that still can come down, but no sign of any kind of significant uptick, which we would watch for, for signs of a rally top. When we look at credit uh, quality uh, and credit spreads, the spreads that uh, investment grade bond investors are expecting over a treasury bond, the excess return that they're demanding to take the corporate risk associated with buying a, a corporate bond has continually narrowed through the course of the year. Same for high yield bonds. In fact, spreads are incredibly narrow, meaning bond investors are not perceiving credit risk. Now that's certainly helped by the Fed and it's certainly helped by monetary stimulus around the world. From an equity risk premium standpoint, in other words, how much are we getting paid to own equities? The earnings yield on the average stock in the S&P 500 is almost two and a half percent higher than the yield on a 10 year bond. So we're getting compensated well for taking risk over a long period of time, that's averaged about 60 basis points or 0.6 of 1%. There have been periods when people were super bullish where in fact, they were happy to take a much lower earnings yield than what they could get on fixed incomes because they assumed earnings would grow. Without assuming any earnings growth, we're getting comp well for equity risk. But I think that if you were to look at expectations, they really are widely varied for next year. We think earnings could be up as much as 30% year over year as we come through the other side of this pandemic. Markets look forward. They look six to nine months into the future and we've all been following the progress as to what to expect on vaccines. And it looks as though we should be in the wheelhouse where the world is reopening over the next six to nine months. Now, a big factor in all of this, uh, all of the asset prices has been the liquidity pushed into the system. And, and it's, it's no small thing. You know, over 20% of all US dollars were printed in 2020. So that is trying to create liquidity to fuel asset prices. And that's being seen all over the world. We've seen central banks in Japan, central banks uh, in Europe and the central bank in the US all push unprecedented amounts of liquidity into the system. And that's important because we know that valuations follow excess liquidity. 
And we've talked about this chart for a while, but valuations can expand a long way when rates are virtually zero and there's lots of liquidity in the system. Now, the central banks have gone a long way to make it clear that different than in the past, they are not afraid right now of inflation. In fact, it's something they'd like to see. They've gone so far as to say, you shouldn't expect short-term rates to rise until as early as 2023. So what is normal is when asset prices really get going, you would expect the Fed to take the punch bowl away, to step in and say, we're gonna tamp down some speculation because we don't want things to get out of hand. They're being very clear to say, we are not reticent or concerned about asset prices at this point. We're gonna watch job growth and that's gonna be the important factor. And that means there's some running room in front of us as far as liquidity goes. We have never had such a combined fiscal and monetary stimulus globally at any point in the past. So you have to respect that. We may not like it, we may not agree with it, but the thing to do in that situation is to own assets. Unfortunately, as investors, we own assets. So money is working its way into equities, big flows into US equities. Money coming out of US dollar, we continue to see weakness in the US dollar versus world currencies. People hold US dollars when they think it's the place to hide. When they get more kind of comfortable with risk, they're more willing to buy riskier assets, often outside the US, take those dollars and do something more productive. So we've seen big flows into global equities. So for instance, emerging markets, this is an emerging markets ETF making new highs today, has had a nice pickup in relative performance versus the US market. We're so focused, all of us on US stocks. And if you wanted to say, well, this is a US centric issue, it's not. Equities around the world are participating in this rally. Nice moves in countries like Korea, Taiwan. We've talked about the fact that Taiwan has just recently broke out of a bear market. It's been in since 2000. So the S&P broke out in 2013, been rallying since. We're used to seeing things in a bull market. NASDAQ 2016. Countries like Korea and Taiwan breaking out only recently after multi-year bear markets. Chinese stocks starting to outperform. Chinese consumer stronger than the, US, than, the, than the Chinese market. Japanese stocks breaking out after many, many years, 30 years of a structural bear market. And companies like Toyota, world beating companies like Toyota, just starting to break out of ranges they've been in, in this case, 14 years. Now, during this period, Cash flow at Toyota almost tripled, but because there was such a dim view of Japanese stocks, these underperformed. So as equity investors, we have lots of choice. We don't have to be focused completely in the US, although the US market is the leader in certain industries like technology and healthcare. But I wanna point out, Expanding breadth is healthy. If more and more stocks in the sector participate, it's healthy. If more and more markets in the equity asset class participate, it's healthy. And after 10 years of underperformance, Asia is starting to outperform the S&P. Other assets that are doing well with a weak dollar and money being printed around the world, Bitcoin. Bitcoin today broke out to new highs above 20,000. And each time it's done it in the past, you get a nice run. So we own some Bitcoin across our strategies. It's one investment. We don't, we aren't Bitcoin fanatics, but there is a regime change taking place and assets that do well in the face of a weaker dollar are starting to show some significant outperformance. You have to recognize these shifts and reposition and be there for the next number of years as other assets participate. Now, we've seen long-term interest rates, not short rates, long-term interest rates march a little higher since summer and certainly since March. And that's important. People say, well, the Fed said they're gonna keep rates low. Well, they say they're gonna keep short rates low. Long rates are more market-driven. They're driven by supply and demand for long-end 
U.S. Treasury bonds. And if investors start to believe that there is more opportunity in equities or there is reflation in the economy, they may choose not to buy as many treasuries. There are lots of people who are captive to the market, have to be there. But there are lots of people who don't, that have been there because it was a safe haven and it was giving a return similar to what they were getting in stocks. But as prices for treasury bonds have been falling through the course of the year, the coupon that investors have been getting at a fraction of 1% doesn't do much to offset prices falling, in this case, from September at $168 to $159. Investors slowly decide, maybe I should take some money elsewhere. So we've seen pretty significant flows out of fixed income over the last few months, last few weeks. And that could only be the beginning. If we go back over the last number of years, uh, treasury bonds perform very well and we are starting to see stocks, bonds versus stocks, bonds are starting to underperform stocks. And they have performed similarly to stocks since 1981, roughly the same return stocks versus bonds. Now, why would money be moving into equities? Well, for one, 63% of stocks in the S&P have a dividend higher than a treasury bond. And a treasury bond is never gonna increase the interest rate it's paying you, it's a fixed return. Corporations, if they run the businesses effectively, have an ability to raise their dividends over time, which is why historically during rising rates, dividend growth stocks outperform. Another regime change. We've been used to owning stocks with high dividends that are sheltered from the economy. We're moving into a regime where companies that are more economically sensitive can grow their earnings faster, thereby growing their dividend faster, makes them more attractive. But you know, this is the beginning. Rates have been falling since 1981. And we do think we're going through a regime change, but the money that has been flowing flying into bonds over the last number of years is likely to moderate. And if we are at a period now, like we were in the late early 1950s when rates started to change, during this period, 1981 to present, stocks and bonds had the same return. In the period from 1951 to 1981, stocks went up 15% a year. Bonds went up 1.6% a year. Inflation was 1.6% a year. Where would you rather be? So I only wanna be in equities if I see breadth expanding, but I see markets breaking out around the world. I see flows into equities in the US and globally. I see flows out of bonds. I think we are early days in this process and we have to be focused in dividend growth. Our income strategies are all focused in dividend growth. Dividend growth exceeded the return of the stock market in the 1950s and 60s, leading to a period in the 1970s where people knew the top 50 dividend growth stocks as the nifty 50, and they traded at 70 to 90 times earnings. This is a theme that's gonna be important for many, many years. And frankly, there's a lot of bonds coming due next year that are gonna to have to be funded by someone. So my guess is yields are likely going higher unless the, the vaccine doesn't work, unless the economy goes back into a deep recession, which at this point, the market is not sensing. Okay, let's talk about sectoral leadership. Certainly uh, the established leadership for the last number of years and off the lows in March was technology. This is the XLK made up of large cap growth stocks. Um, do new all-time high today, uh, certainly consolidated through November, uh, broke out, pulled back a little as, as the repositioning was getting ready for the Tesla inclusion in the S&P 500, but certainly they've started to lift. Uh, if you look at Apple, Apple consolidated from August until present, now just starting to break out of this tight consolidation. And Amazon did the same thing today. Microsoft looks like it did the same thing today. So the large cap tech stocks are looking to reaccelerate versus the market. And importantly, a lot of the speculators came out. This is call volume over the last couple of months in Apple. It got very, very low 
with people talk about all the call buying recently, and there's lots of it out there, but in the very large FANG names, call buying uh, really became more muted and a lot of speculation came out. This is probably ready for the next leg higher. Semiconductors make new relative strength highs today. As a group, we have exposure to things like LAM research and advanced micro devices. Certainly this continues to be leadership. It's the most economically sensitive or cyclical part of technology. The part that does the best in a stronger economy. And this is the basic building block of the world's economy. We watch very closely for breadth to reverse in semiconductors that would tell us that people are becoming less optimistic. That is not the case. Breadth continues to improve. LAM Research, one of the leaders. Consumer discretionary, 70% of the US economy, consumer discretionary. Uh, sorry, is the consumer. Consumer discretionary, the most economically sensitive after consolidating through November, early December, breaking out here along with Amazon uh, today. But companies like um, Chipotle, uh, companies like Nike, uh, companies like Home Depot, all looking quite attractive. Biotech and healthcare has been strong all the way through the year, continues to be quite strong, perhaps a little bit overcooked, could certainly pull back a little bit in the short run. The genomics companies have been very, very strong. The medical device companies have been very strong. Less economically sensitive may be a source of funds to move into more economically sensitive. But as we pointed out last week, now 89% of the sectors are in uptrends. It's a broad-based rally, which gives us lots of other choices. After underperforming early in the year, industrials have been outperforming recently, certainly within industrials, robotics and automation stocks really having a good move. This is relative price strength versus the S&P. No sign of a slowdown there. Metals and mining. So this is a weak dollar asset. This is a reflationary asset. It's a cyclical asset. The mining stocks have been in a bear market for 10 years. And the largest of them consolidated their strength, built their leadership position, continued to grow, and on the other side, start to look really attractive. So this is a bear market that the metals group is apparently coming out of. And I look at companies like Rio Tinto, which have consolidated for over five years, not like the group falling and falling, now making new all-time highs with a dividend yield here of about 5%. That's the type of company that can do well in a reflationary environment. Other companies like that, Freeport, McMoran, Copper and Gold. So dividends, but that are more economically sensitive and that can grow more quickly if the demand in the economy grows. And clearly there's gonna be a lot of restocking coming out of the pandemic and people have some money to spend. Gold, gold price, having made a turn over the course of the last few years, rallied, consolidated over the last few weeks. If you take the silver stocks, for instance, this is the, the silver miners ETF, SIL, rallied into the end of July, consolidated over the last uh, three months, and looks as though it's at the process point now where it's ready to break out again as the US dollar weakens, the gold stocks are similar. And certainly we talked a little bit about Bitcoin. Things we don't own and things that are well-loved and probably over-owned. We have very low weights in things like utilities and telcos, consumer staple stocks and REITs. The relative price performance has been falling all year. They do pay nice dividends, but if you're losing capital while you're getting your dividend, not a big win. There's certainly winners and losers within these groups. I've talked about Nextera as being a growth utility because of its exposure to alternative energy, wind and solar, attractive. But this group is still trading, you know, 11, 12% below the highs in February. Uh, REITs similar, still well down from the highs in February. I'm, I'm, I worry because I think these are overowned by individual investors and well-loved. They've been a wonderful place to be for many, many years during falling rates. But if we get rising rates, rising rates are not great for real estate and rising rates are not great for utilities. So high dividend paying stocks, this is the SPHD ETF, still down substantially on the year from where we were in February, where the dividend growth ETF, RDVY, now up 7% on the year and relative to the stock market itself, outperforming the stock market. 
So we suggest that for income-oriented investors, they want to be focused on dividend growth, maybe a lower yield, but more growth in the dividend, which would help offset rising rates. So as far as exposure goes, this is a continual process. We're iterating all the time. You know, we took technology down from just over 30%, which is market weight uh, in the early part of the fall. We've been rebuilding our position slowly. It's about 26% of our overall holdings across all of our mandates. Certainly certain mandates, which are lower risk or income oriented, we have a little less technology and the growth mandates a little bit more. Industrial second largest weight, financials have become a more significant weight. It's about a 10% weight in the S&P, we're at 13%. This is a group that's underperformed for 10 years, but does well in rising rates. Materials, we are well overweight. Materials, probably three times market weight. Uh, we have a good consumer discretionary weight, but when we look at groups like utilities, a very low weight, consumer staples, a low weight, healthcare, a low weight, uh, and, um, and real estate, very, very low weight. So let's talk from a macro perspective. And the macro strategy that we run, just to give you a window on this, our biggest weight would be US stocks. We have lots of exposure in US equities, online, uh, online retail, uh, growth at a reasonable price, uh, the building and construction ETF, technology, technology, industrials, semiconductors, solar, consumer discretionary, things that we've been talking about. We have exposure to Japan, global small cap securities, Taiwan, EWT, home of semiconductors, and, and Korea. In emerging markets, we have exposure to China broadly through ASHR, the Emerging Markets ETF PIE, which is a broad-based emerging market ETF, the Chinese Consumer ETF, Mexico, Chinese web companies, and Chinese technology companies. So equities, a significant weight. Commodities though, the second largest weight. Gold and silver miners, agricultural uh, 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 corporations, commodities themselves, base metals, uh, lithium and battery producers, and a small weight in energy. From a currency perspective, we are short the US dollar. We are hedged back currently to Canada because Canadian dollar is strengthening. From a fixed income standpoint, we are short fixed income across the board. Investment grade, high yield, and long end of the treasury market with a view that treasury price is likely to fall for some time. And we have a small short position in volatility because volatility remains elevated, but is falling. So that mirrors our view. We have a good sized weight in basic materials, a good sized weight in equities, although less focused just on the US today, more globally oriented. We're trying to position against rising rates in fixed income. And from a currency perspective, it appears the world is more risk accepting. So we wanna be short US dollars. The portfolios are doing well year to date. Our equity portfolio is up 32% on the year, well ahead of a blended benchmark between the US and Canada. Our long short portfolio is really having a great year. It's up just about 40%. Uh, and the income portfolio relative to a benchmark of the aggregate bond index, and the dividend paying ETF is about in line. It's been a difficult year so far for income investments, but certainly we think uh, we're picking up a lot of steam against the, against the universe. And certainly the dividend growth stocks are performing well. During the pandemic, the biggest concern by investors was whether dividends would get paid. And I think that we are now in a market where the world is looking beyond the pandemic to what dividend growth can look like in the future. Look, we watch every day for signs of weakness. Our breadth models right now are positive. If they were to start to deteriorate, we take that seriously and we get very focused on playing defense. When we went through the decline in February, March, the portfolios on average gave up about half what the market gave up. And that's been our historical norm. But at this point, I think things look pretty good. So as we come to the end of the year, who would have believed in March if somebody had told us the news stories that we'd be living with, that the market would be where it is. Thank God for process. We're gonna to continue to go through this step-by-step. Step. 
We'll continue to update for those that have uh, a direct questions, certainly happy to answer them. Uh, but Pam, if there's any questions right now, maybe we can address them. Hi, Dave. Thank you very much for such a great overview. Uh, we do have a few questions this afternoon. The first being, and I know you touched on dividend growth, but often there's a little bit of confusion between dividend growth and yield, um, high yield equities. So the question from this investor is, why do investors care about high yield equities when they are adjusted in, in the stock price the same amount? Higher yield, higher stock price adjustment. David, could you please comment? Sure. Well, there's, there's big differences between high yielding equities and dividend growth stocks. Um, at a time when you think the economy may be weak, or if you think inflation is gonna continue to fall, you wanna tie in a company that has an ability to pay a steady dividend for a long period of time, no matter what happens in the economy. So we can use as an example, say a pipeline. Uh, or, a, or an electric utility. On the other hand, if you think the economy is going to accelerate uh, and rates might move higher, a yield that looks attractive, say at a 4% yield, might not look so attractive if you could be in a stock that was growing at 15% and growing its dividend at 20%. So at some point, investors in that high dividend paying stock that has no growth are going to want to be sellers. It's the same reason why if you own a bond that pays you 1% and yields available on a similar maturity go to 2%, nobody's going to pay you a price for that bond that yields them 1%. They're going to want a discount on the bond. So when you get into a reflationary environment, Yes, in every case, the return you get as an investor is a combination of what happens to the share price and the dividend. But if you wind up in a reflationary environment with a fixed dividend, whether it's high or not, the share price is going to fall over time as people leave to go to something that will benefit from the strengthening economy. Money goes to the place where it's treated the best. So what we want in a strengthening economy are companies that benefit from that. And the total return we're gonna receive is the yield, likely plus some capital growth. Thanks so much, Dave. The next question we've added uh, to our position in Bitcoin. We've also uh, have participated in SPACs. Uh, maybe you could comment on what a SPAC is to those investors who don't know. Sure. Um, and how do you address the concerns surrounding volatility around those two types of um, investment vehicles? Yeah, listen, everything has its inherent volatility. And when we say we've made an investment, for instance, in Bitcoin, it's like, it's like saying this is one position in a portfolio. So maybe it's a 3% weight or a 4% weight, like, like, an, like an equity. Or, or like a preferred share, uh, we take into account what kind of volatility could come from that. Now, you have to look forward, not backwards. And certain things that have been volatile in the past may be a lot less volatile going forward if you're in an environment where there's a solid bid for that asset. Now, uh, what's happening on special purpose uh, uh, corporations is that this has become a way for um, uh, entrepreneurs who have built a very strong reputation to say, I would like you to invest uh, in my SPAC and I am going to use my expertise to go out and find an appropriate business to buy within that SPAC and it will be a public vehicle going forward. Uh, it seemed to be an efficient way to raise funds. It seemed to be an efficient way to put a business into a public company. Uh, and certainly uh, there are a lot of them being done. It's not lost on us that there are a lot of IPOs and a lot of SPACs being done. And that reminds you of the 1990s. But I remind you, first of all, the 1990s went on for a long time. And, and you know, markets made new high after new high after new high. The thing that's different right now that we have to keep in mind, and I recognize, we always have to be careful when we say what's different, is that historically, 
when the market really gets going, the central banks get concerned about that and want to tamp it down. The central banks are incredibly concerned right now about the economic headwinds that we're facing, and they want all the confidence that there could be in public markets. So they've been very clear and actually quite uh, careful to say it out loud. Do not expect us to raise rates for several years. What they're saying is you have a green light to put your money into a risk asset. We are not going to take the knees out from under you on a Tuesday morning with a surprise rate hike. So, you know, we're in a world where there is a lot of debt. Uh, uh, central banks understand that if you have a debt problem, lots of liabilities, you need to have lots of assets on the other side to offset them. So they're working at expanding the value of the global assets to help offset the risk of the debt on the other side. So as, as investors, if we have capital, the worst thing that we could do is sit in cash right now. If, if you have capital, you need to be in productive assets. Uh, sadly, there's a huge uh, spectrum of the population who don't have assets and are not participating in this. So I think one of my biggest fears is this widens the gap between the haves and the have nots. But in the near term, this is one of the only tools that the central banks and governments have. Thanks, David. The next question, do you find that the enthusiasm and participation in IPOs such as Airbnb and DoorDash, do those concern you? Is this behavior reminiscent of the tech bubble of 2000? I think for sure we have to look at everything that we invest in. And remember, there are great companies coming to market and there are not so good companies coming to market. If you go back to 1999, the stage at which companies came to market was way, way earlier. They were companies that had no company. They were an idea with zero dollars of revenue. And in many cases, very little capital backing them up. Because there's been so much private equity in the market, these businesses have gone a lot further in being developed before they ever become public. Now, whether or not the valuations are correct as they come to market, that's for us to try and understand and decide whether they are valuations that we are willing to pay or not. So listen, a very small amount of the money that we manage goes into IPOs. The vast majority of the holdings are companies that have been trading in the market, but there are some wonderful companies coming and certainly you have to take a hard look at them. And then you have to apply your process and your disciplines around being a disciplined seller if they don't work out and manage your, manage your portfolios. I think that we are in a time right now where there is greater ability to be diversified than we have had in many, many years. We have had a market that's been very narrow, a small number of leading companies, which we can all document, and a small number of themes or sectors that were well set up to deal with the current environment. Now, as the world looks at reopening, there are a whole series of industries that have been uninvestable over the course of the last year, and some of them over many years that are opening up as opportunities. And while there are very expensive companies in the market, there's some really inexpensive companies. Like these leading uh, commodity companies are wonderful businesses and really not expensive and really under owned because they've been out of favor for 10 years. So it's always about recognizing where the next major themes are and starting to build a position. If the positions start to work, looking at adding at them, following them along with stop losses. Um, I understand there's concern around set positive sentiment in the market and speculation. You have to keep that in mind. But right now the alternative is sitting in cash being devalued by the day. As remember, I said 21% of all the US dollars in circulation were created this year. That's taking a pie that used to be cut in eight pieces and selling it cut in 12. You get less for the dollar. 
And so we need to find things to own that will hold value versus a declining dollar. And we're invested in a host of those things. Dave, next question. Companies that are correlated to the Keystone pipeline, how would Barometer look at those particular companies, especially given that we have this Georgia runoff for the Senate just around the corner in January? What would be your thoughts to those investors that are holding um, oil and gas companies that are tied to that pipeline and the potential risk if Biden decides to cancel it? Look, I, I think that there are a lot of risks around energy. Um, it's why uh, share prices in the energy sector have been falling since 2014. And yes, they've had a nice bump over the last few months. Um, we look at it with some degree of skepticism. I think there is no question that there is going to be regulatory friction for the energy industry. Um, both in Canada and in the US and frankly, globally. You know, ESG as a theme is not going away. There's a reason why if we compare uh, the, uh, the TAN, T-A-N, solar ETF, let's see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Um, give me a moment to see if I can find what I'm looking for. Um, here we go. So there's a reason why the solar ETF has done what it's doing over the last two years. Let's make it a little near, more near term. That's year to date versus what's been happening in energy producers. Um, so I, I think that you have to be cognizant of the environment that we're in. We are going to face headwinds in energy in Canada, clearly from our, from, from Ottawa, uh, and, and out of the U S and, um, pipelines in general fall more into that bond proxy camp. So you also probably have a macro headwind. So these are, these are problematic. And I would be a little cautious with that whole space. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much. We'll see you in the new year. Thanks, folks.